Welcome back to the Nutramedical Report on Thursday, the 3rd of May, and we have an amazing guest who I'm sure will be on regularly, Gary Creep. And Gary, you have the uh, amazing uh, breadth of knowledge in so many geopolitical areas. Your website is usjf.net, usjf, the US Justice Foundation.net, usjf.net. And uh, <clears throat> let's start off with the whole, as I said before the show, line up all these topics like tin cans on a wall that we're going to do target practice on. <clears throat> let's uh, let's roll with starting with something like the uh, the uh, Stein case, uh, the issues of the internet, and much more. Uh, let's just uh, talk about whatever is the current uh, I call issue du jour. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you for your kind words, and thank you for having me on your show again. Uh, Starting off with the Sergeant Stein case, um, many people won't know it by that name, but they'll probably know it by the tea, name of the Tea Party Marine case, the uh, Marine who on a private website where only a few people were, uh, you had to be a member to get access to it, and only a total of five people actually saw it before the Marines blew it all out of proportion. Uh, Sergeant Stein said some many, uh, Sergeant Gary Stein, an, an, uh, a nine-year Marine Corps veteran, said some inappropriate things, even he admits that, about uh, uh, Mr. Obama. Uh, the comments were made in the heat of a discussion. Specifically, it was a discussion about whether United States Marine Corps uh, uh, members of the United States Marine Corps should obey an unconstitutional order to round up American citizens and take them to detention t- camps under the indefinite detention provisions of the National Defense Authorization Act signed by uh, Mr. Obama uh, on Jan- in January of this year. And uh, the context was essentially uh, uh, Sergeant Stein said that if he was ordered to do that, he would not obey that order, and that if Obama told him that he had to, he'd or if he was told that he had to, he'd say, screw Obama, I'm not going to obey that order. Now, you may not like the language. There was actually much rougher language spoken by another Marine during the same uh, Internet conversation, but that Marine is not being punished. Uh, that uh, only Sergeant Stein. In fact, it came out during the uh, administrative separation proceedings that I attended as part of his civilian legal team that uh, another Marine who was a witness against Sergeant Stein used much more uh, inappropriate language uh, in, a, in a, captioning a picture in which that captain was in full uh, dress uh, uniform uh, and made obscene references to people that he considered uh, political opponents. And that captain is not being punished, of course. Only Sergeant Stein is. And I believe that Sergeant Stein is being punished because, number one, he spoke out against Mr. Obama, and the Obama administration will not allow that to happen. Number two, I believe that he was singled out because this did become public, although not at his instigation. It became public as a result of other people's actions. And number three, Mr. Obama hates the military, uh, hates what it stands for, and he wants to, uh, you know, put it in line and so that it will automatically obey whatever will receive issues, constitutional or not. And so uh, t- as of tomorrow, according to my latest conversations with Sergeant Stein, uh, Sergeant Stein will be kicked out, of the, will be formally fin- being finished processed out of the Marine Corps, and he will be a civilian with a, a young child, a pregnant wife, no job, needing work, and uh, having essentially uh, uh, nothing to, he, he, d- he didn't even get his last month's pay according to the most recent conversation I had with him. So my foundation, the United States Justice Foundation, is representing Sergeant Stein. I'm the lead attorney in conjunction with other, there's other attorneys involved too. In fact, the ECLU is uh, one of my co-counsel in the case, uh, challenging the Marines uh, kicking uh, Sergeant Stein out of the Marine Corps. That's one of the most obscene things I've ever heard is people willing to put their life on the line for the military, for the government, for the United States Constitution, and for fellow citizens, and a private conversation made in the heat of the moment can terminate his career. That is one of the most obscene things I've ever heard. It's literally well, it's, <clears throat> it's trying to break ahead, the back sorry. of the hope of the, of the military, whether you're in the field of operations, as he has multiple times uh, over in Afghanistan and Iraq, or you're actually back home and managing and do your job, he has a constitutional right to be able to, to voice his opinions, even if they're a little out of uh, color. He certainly doesn't deserve to have his career terminated. Well, the Marine Corps, uh, during the what they call the ADCEP hearing, the administrative separation hearing, which lasted for 15 hours, I should point out, uh, in one day, it went from 8 o'clock in the morning to 11 p.m. at night. And I was there as civilian co-counsel. Uh, 
But they admitted during the asset period that they, they did not, the Marine Corps did not legally have the right to kick him out of the Marine Corps. They admitted it, but they went ahead and did it anyway. They didn't Wait, care. You and, know what my question is, though? And this is a little bit of Aussie humor because I have some Aussie friends. Uh, it's very hard to corral kangaroos. So I wonder how they managed to get all those kangaroos into one court in one room for 15 hours. <laughs> well. I, I don't know, but uh, it was clear from the out from the start that there were numerous procedural wrongdoings by the Marine Corps in their presentation of their case. Um, we had there was a colonel. We had the two captains defending uh, Sergeant Stein, and uh, there was a colonel there who was their supervisor. He was the uh, Southwest uh, Regional Supervisor for all the Defense Council in the JAG Corps for the Marine Corps. They don't call them JAGs, but what we, you and I would know as JAG, Judge Advocate Generals. Um, anyway, they were all there. And, uh, here, he was. This colonel was there, and the major who was in, who was actually running the show, even though legally he was not supposed to be. When the colonel pointed out that the major was was violating Marine Corps policy and violating the rights of the accused, i.e., Sergeant Stein, during the hearing, the major threatened to have the colonel physically removed from the hearing. Uh, I mean, that's just extraordinary for an, an organization that claims to be so much about discipline, so much about order, for a major to threaten a, a, a colonel with physically being removed because he was objecting to something improper that the major was doing. That runs against the entire basis of the Marine Corps. And the Marine, and, I, and the Marine Corps should be embarrassed by what happened at that hearing. Colonel Dowling, the, the head of the 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 battalion commander should be embarrassed because he allowed it to go on. And Lieutenant Colonel Harrison, who was head of the tribunal, should be embarrassed because he let it go on. This was a farce. This was a show trial, something right out of Nazi Germany or Russia. They, they made comments on the record such as, well, we're not good. We're not setting this up so well, a federal can court to do <clears throat> something about it. Well, it's also a part of the game that's being played with the media. Uh, to uh, The same thing that's going on in Florida is now happening with the Marine. They're taking a person who is completely out of the correct context and actually abusing him with not a legal system but a kangaroo court and a star chamber approach to uh, to not justice but injustice. I like to use the word just hyphen us. And that's what we have with uh, not only the media but Obama and even the Marine Corps trying to walk a lockstep. What are they going to gain by, by destroying their own traditions and their own uh, you know high morals of the Marines? I mean, this is pretty disturbing. Well, the, it, under the Uniform Code of Military Justice, a uh, Marine is absolutely prohibited from obeying an unlawful order, such as con, such as the discussion that Sergeant Stein was, was having uh, about, which was, in addition to the rounding of American citizens for indefinite detention, they are also talking about conf, confiscating legally held weapons by U.S. citizens. And, you know, the, the Marine Corps are prohibited by the Uniform Code of Military Justice from enforcing such orders, and Sergeant Stein was saying, yeah, I'm not going to obey orders that are unlawful, and that is his obligation, not just his right, it's his obligation. He could be punished by uh, not ob by obeying unlawful orders, and, and, and the Marines there were agreeing with that, but just one of them decided, for whatever reason, maybe some personal uh, animus, I don't know, to go after Sergeant Stein, he forwarded it, the uh, the discussion to a superior, then erased it from from the Facebook. So you can't find that discussion on Facebook now, because within minutes after the discussion was had, it was erased. Uh, and but you know somebody decided they wanted to get Sergeant Stein. You know it, it's ridiculous. Somebody wanted to I guess get brownie points with the superior officers, so they started to, decided to nail him. Or somebody just as an Obama. Well, no, this so right. leads into the leads into the internet now because this is dealing with a private uh, a special uh, Facebook account. Uh, let's get into the internet now because we have the CISPA, and we've made many uh, previous attempts to get total control of the internet. When we come back. We'll open up this next can of worms and put it up on the wall and take pot shots at it. And our, the first can went down very nicely. Let's see what the next can will do. We'll be back in just a moment with Gary Creep. And again, the website is usjf.net. Back in a moment. Jf.net. 
Gary, let's talk about the Internet, and then let's uh, get into the NDAA, the National Defense Authorization Act, and at first the usurper-in-chief, the Obamanocchio puppet in the White House, said, no, 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 I won't sign it, I won't sign it, and Soros, Geppetto, and the globalists forced the satanic minion to sign it, and all of a sudden the empowering act, the enabling act of Dare Fuhrer in the White House was passed. It's unbelievable how obscene the NDAA is, but it's tied in with CISPA, which is the next act to try to take total control of the Internet. Let's get into that. What's going on with the Internet? Well, as you know, there was first PIPA and SOPA, which was uh, respect. PIPA was the uh, Senate bill, uh, S-968, and uh, uh, SOPA was the House bill, uh, H.R. 3261, to try to give the federal government complete control over the Internet. Then came, at, those were stopped because Google and, and a lot of groups, including my group, the United States Justice Foundation, launched major campaigns. We bombarded Congress with hundreds of thousands of phone calls and faxes, and Google ran big ads, and a lot of groups did. Then we had ACTA, and ACTA was a whole new, whole new thing, and ACTA is actually a treaty now between the United States and other foreign countries, including China, Iran, etc., and a treaty is required by the United States Constitution to be submitted to and approved by the U.S. Senate. Mr. Obama decided he didn't have to do that. Of course, he's above the law. Uh, I understand that he claims to have been a constitutional law professor, and, and if, if he was, and there's, there's no evidence to support that, but if he was, he's either the dumbest constitutional law professor that there's ever been, or he just purposely lies, cheats, and steals, and doesn't care what the truth is about the Constitution. He just twists it to his own words. So... ACTA was, uh, among other things, would have given the right of signer countries, including the United States, to search all electronic devices every time anyone went in or out of the country. So let's say you're going to go to England for a vacation or business, and you, you know, come back when you leave the United States uh, under the treaty, under ACTA, uh, you, your computer could be searched by U.S. government border agents, your cell phone could be searched, your Kindle, anything you have that is electronic, we search for, for information by the federal government. Same is true in China or Iran. If you go to China, if you go to Iran, if you go to Israel, first signing on the uh, that program or onto the, uh, the act, you would basically be forced to allow them to search your, your items. And if they found something on it that they considered illegal or objectionable, like a violation, they could then take you into custody, and they could confiscate your cell phone or whatever. Now, because the Constitution requires the treaty to be approved, Mr. A Mr. Obama came up with this idea of something called a sole executive agreement, where he claimed he had the right on behalf of the United States to in, uh, sign on to this uh, international treaty simply by signing it, that he did not need to send an approval. Now, I've read some writings of some constitutional scholars, and even the liberal ones who support Mr. Obama say that his reasoning is, some, is very problematic, because it's very clear in the Constitution that uh, a treaty needs to go to the U.S. Senate, and he refused to send it. So we've been mounting a campaign trying to force the Senate to take it up and to reject it. But the Senate, the spinal Senate, between the, the Obama lovers like Reid and the spinal senators uh, that uh, on the Republican side, uh, most of whom uh, are only interested in power, not in the Constitution, they aren't willing to do it because they don't see a political gain because it's too involved and too complex, blah, blah, blah. There's been a few of uh, the good guys who have spoken up about it, but... Uh, but um, O'Connell, excuse me, Mitch McConnell won't take it up. And Senate, Senate leadership in both the House, the Republican leadership, I should say, in both the House and the Senate, are spineless. They're only interested in power. They don't care about the Constitution. They're only interested in things they can throw at Obama. And if they don't see political gain by a certain vote or a certain action, they're not going to. They're not going to take it because all they want to do is they want. They, they're pro-big government. They just want them to be in control of the big government uh, instead of the Democrats. Uh, I remember a few years ago I was at a meeting with Congressman Buck McKeon of California, and he made the comment that big government was good as long as the Republicans are in control. And we just lambasted them because big government's bad no matter, no matter who's in control. But uh, the Repu most of the Republicans are just big government supporters. Even a, lot of the, even a number of the Tea Party activists who got elected in 2010 have already been co-opted by the lure of power. And, and that's such a shame. Yeah, it really is uh, bad. And now, th this also ties in with the 
uh, was where you see going in the selection. Um, what what well, do you see as the analysis? Yeah, what do you see as the analysis we, uh, from your viewpoint of what's happening? Because we have two alternatives now. We have Obama and we have Romney, and we have uh, a, a, a battle coming up here where Ron Paul is still standing, and basically everyone else is gone. Well, we, we don't really have a – we're not going to have a battle. The only battle is going to be between – uh, social, uh, complete socialism and and partial socialism. Exactly. Yeah. Well, in other words, we don't really have an alternative. Is what I'm trying to say. I call it Obamni. In other words, we right. get Obama or Romney. We get Obamni. Well, right now we've got CISPA coming down, which the House, a lot of the big government Republicans are pushing. It's supposed to, getting back to the Internet, CISPA, it's supposed to protect our infrastructure, but it also gives federal government a lot more power over the Internet. And, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, look, do we need to protect our infrastructure from cyber hacking and tax and all that? Of course we do. That's, that's just a given. You, you don't need but, another blob, but what they're doing is forcing uh, smart meters, which are increasing the hackability of our infrastructure, increasing the, uh, the frequency drift in fires or electronic problems, increasing cyber hacking risks from the Blue Army in Tianjin, China, or any other countries if we do actually go to war, the first step of a foreign country, well, not to shoot missiles, but to take control of our power controllers for our power grid. You know, of and it, it, Yeah, exactly. And it, it doesn't need another law to control the, quote, the general Internet. It needs to have, the uh, number one, don't force smart meters on people. Number two, do harden the, the uh, and have separate routing system so that the grid cannot be hacked into by anybody and uh, do have redundancy that's like they found recently was a problem with the Southern California power grid system. Uh, but it's like taking a, a an elephant gun to kill a fly. There's no need for it. Well, part of the problem is, is that they throw in a lot of other stuff that's got nothing to do with protecting the security of the infrastructure, the internet infrastructure. Exactly. What they, exactly. What, I'm not an internet person. I don't claim to have you know, the, the answer of the magic and all that. But what I can tell you is they could cut out these problems if they just make them closed loops and not have anybody in the world being able to get into the uh, into the programming. They just cut it all off from, all, from everything outside, you know, and, and then that's how they protect them. They don't want to do that. Uh, they want to use uh, that, that potential problem. It is a real potential problem, or a real problem, uh, given the, the ability of the hackers these days. They want to keep it open so that they can use the excuse to crack down on the rest of us so they can control what we can see, hear, and do on the Internet. I mean, let's, moving off into a related topic, you know, you've, we've now got the release of the information about this huge facility that we're, the federal government spending billions of dollars on in the Utah desert. Yeah, that's a three million, uh, three million uh, square foot facility with supercomputers and a database to collect, like the Fusion Center's information on American citizens and citizens of other countries. When we come back, we want to open up this can of worms next. This is a big deal. The Super Cyber Center in Utah is another obscenity by the abominator in the White House. Back in a moment. It, it may not happen right away, but it'll set in like the rigor mortis. Because the anger of the public is going to rise quite a bit over this. Welcome back, and lots of other topics to talk about. Um, the, uh, the issue of uh, the illegal immigrants and the Arizona bill, which, you, of course, you've talked about at the USJF website last year. Uh, there's a number of other states you mentioned on the break, uh, Gary, that, are, that have replicated the Arizona illegal immigration bill. And what, what's happening there in terms of actually being you know, fair and reasonable to other our, our Hispanic citizens, but also making sure there's a proper process and they don't kind of jump forward on it because it appears that the Democratic Party and Obama are trying to curry to the um, Hispanic vote when I think it's very likely that the running mate, for example, for um, Romney will probably be Rubio, who happens to come from Cuba. Right. Well, uh, as you know, it's B-1070 was recently debated for the U.S. Supreme Court, and uh, Justice Kagan, interestingly enough, despite the fact she refused to recuse herself uh, on the Obamacare bill, which she was mandated by law to do, I believe, she did recuse herself on the SB 1070 bill. Now, U.S. Justice Foundation filed a brief with the Supreme Court on behalf of uh, Arizona State Senator Lori Klein and uh, Miniman uh, and the uh, Miniman Project of the Declaration Alliance. Uh, 
in support of the legislation. And in the questioning and the uh, arguments and the questioning by the Supreme Court justices, it appeared clear, at least to me, that uh, there's uh, five votes, maybe even six votes, to uphold it. Justice Sotomayor, who was, uh, was uh, appointed by Mr. Obama with the understanding that she'd be a solid liberal vote, a pro-big government vote and all that, uh, indicated uh, skepticism as to the position of the uh, federal government on, on that legislation and seem to be adopting a pro-constitution line that the federal government can't control what a state does to protect its citizens within a state. Now, Justice Sotomayor recently voted with the conservative wing in a very important decision that I was also involved with, the U.S. versus Antoine Jones case. And in that case, the uh, Justice Scalia writing for the majority, joined by Justice uh, Sotomayor, wrote that the federal government that does not have the rights to conduct a, a, a computerized tracking uh, of individuals for as long as they want, for any reason they want, and must adhere to the Founding Fathers' uh, understanding and principles of the Fourth Amendment. And Justice, Justice Sotomayor joined in that decision. It was a five to four decision. Justice Alito voted with the liberals, interestingly enough, on that. The overall decision was nine to nothing to overturn the conviction because of the, uh, the way that it was obtained. Uh, so that was unanimous, but then they broke down five to four by the reasoning. And Justice Scalia, in the majority opinion, lifted heavily from a brief written by Herb Titus, Bill Olson, and myself uh, as co-counsel uh, in that case. And so we were, that's one of the most amazing victories I think I've ever seen at the Supreme Court, because the Supreme Court uh, accepted, uh, directed the parties to argue something they hadn't argued in their briefs, that, but we argued in our friend of the court brief on the petition stage. The Supreme Court argued, argued, ordered the parties to argue the issue we raised. They didn't in, in reality. So we argued it on the merit stage, and Justice Scalia lifted heavily from our brief. So I, I'm starting to have some hope from Justice Sotomayor. I uh, opposed her appointment because I was afraid she'd just be another lockstep, lockstep liberal. Uh, but uh, she has uh, proven to be uh, started to vote with the Constitution and not just uh, what Mr. Obama wants her to vote, like Justice Kagan uh, seems to be doing. That's kind of amazing, isn't it? That's uh, quite a surprise. Um, yes. What about these other issues about coming up to the election? We have a lot of ele electronic election fraud. How are we going to prevent the fraud from actually stealing the election this time? Well, l l let me just finish the answer to the question you just posed to me. You know, there's uh, Alabama and Georgia follow suit, uh, passing law similar to uh, Arizona. Alabama even bragged that its law was stiffer. When the right. Justice Department went after Alabama, Alabama revised their laws to try to get out of the lawsuit, and, and that's still kind of up in the air, but they did revise their laws. Georgia fought it. In fact, uh, uh, you know, my group, the United States Justice Foundation, we were involved in defending that law on behalf of two state legislators and uh, rightmarch.com uh, in, that, in that matter. And that matter is now up on appeal, and, but I, everything's kind of on hold to the Supreme Court, I believe. I, I can't say that for sure, but I have reason to believe that uh, that case is basically on hold until after the Supreme Court decides the SB 1070 case. Um, now... As far as uh, the voter fraud, uh, as we discussed, my foundation is funding a group called Defend the Vote in Illinois, which has some of the worst voter fraud in the country. And they found massive evidence of voter fraud. More people voting. They, we're talking about, you know, usually if you have, you know, a thousand people registered these days, three or four or five hundred may vote. Well, in, in, in precinct after precinct, more people voted in the 2008 election than were registered to vote. That means you had 100 percent plus turnout, which or, yeah, or you're having happen. people voting from the grave, right? Yeah. So yeah. we don't, you know, and, and they're going through an analysis of that, but they found in precinct after precinct that they, there was 100 percent plus turnout in heavily democratic areas. So that raises certain issues, obviously. Issues, um, yeah, it does. And, that's, a, that's a very good term. I guess is that a legal term you learn after law school? <laughs> Something like that, yeah. <laughs> but uh, but, we, but anyway, here. <laughs> so we're we're funding that to investigation. We expect lawsuits to come out of that. In fact, we're funding a lawsuit. Uh, we funding we funded one, and now we're funding a second lawsuit in Illinois over over vote, uh, over candidate irregularities in in Illinois. 
Okay. Um, well, now, that leads to the next issue, which is Sheriff Arpaio is being pushed by everybody, including Lindsay Williams, to actually finally release not only the the fake uh, birth certificate data, the fake use of the Social Security number where he never was resident in Connecticut, and fake uh, other materials that prove some very embarrassing things about the usurper in chief. Uh, right now, we have Democratic organizations here in California and elsewhere that wanted to try to run other candidates instead of Obama for president for this term, and we don't have that. Um, what's going on in terms of the issue? Are you involved in that, or do you have any opinion on what's happening? Because we're hoping that some move will make, because the regular media won't touch this issue, even though it's been very likely that he'll be struck from at least one voter registry in Arizona. Hopefully it'll be a domino effect. But uh, what do we do after that? I mean, uh, the Democratic Party are committing, in a sense, uh, political suicide because they're putting all their eggs in the Obama basket. Maybe they figure they can switch uh, horses and get uh, Hillary Clinton in there, but uh, I don't think that's a very wise move on their part. Well, as uh, presumably you don't know, I'm lead counsel on Drake versus Obama, which is That's a why challenge. I, brought it up. I, I, I knew that. <laughs> Drake, yeah. well, Drake v. Obama is currently on appeal to the United States Supreme Court, and we're waiting for scheduling. It's the only case at the U.S. Supreme Court uh, on the issue, and um, right now we're waiting for a scheduling order. And, uh, and, and first, they have to decide whether to hear it, and then if they do. Uh, we'll go from there. We also have a case of Dumay versus Bowen, which is a case in California that I'm uh, lead counsel on, challenging whether Mr. Obama can be on the California uh, state presidential primary ballot. Uh, and then uh, ultimately that will morph into one on the state presidential ballot. And actually we feel we have some good hope on that because the main thrust of the challenge is, is, is that a law in California which forces the Secretary of State to violate her oath of office and to ignore her statutory obligation and to put on the ballot whoever the major parties say she has to put on the ballot irregardless of their, um, irregardless of their eligibility or whether they provide any proof or not. In other words, she has to violate her own oath of office to do something that the National Party has asked her to do. Right. So we've filed a lawsuit challenging that. It's uh, Election Code Section 6901 in California. We also, I was, we also had a challenge in Philadelphia that was blown out by the courts there, or in Pennsylvania, I should say, and I was co-counsel on that. We had a challenge in Illinois that was blown out by the courts there. And I was co-counsel on that. We're filing this week a challenge in Alabama to Mr. Obama being on the presidential primary ballot. And uh, we'll be refiling in both Pennsylvania and Illinois. Yeah, I think it's a, a better than 50-50 a chance that Mr. Obama will be uh, the subject of what I call the Obamanectomy politi- geopolitically here in 2012. Uh, I'm not certain that he will be the candidate running for president when it comes around to November. If all this works out, we'll keep praying it does. Back in a moment. And we're back with Gary Creep. Gary, the, the whole issue of what's happening in America and what's going on, we have a, a remarkable changes. This uh, Drake versus Obama, the issue of whether or not he'll be, he'll be struck from the voter ledgers, uh, the issue that's going to come up in June, which is just a month away, I think it's actually by the first week in June we're going to have a decision from the Supreme Court on whether Obamacare lives or dies. If Obamacare dies, uh, and this, by the way, is not a health care policy. Most people don't realize it's kind of accidentally or incidentally involves health care. It literally changes the entire structure of society under Obamacare. Um, it, uh, it also changes the entire concept of federal government being one of limited and enumerated powers. Right. In other words, they can develop power for anything. They can say, everybody in America has to buy an electric car. Everybody has to eat cereal in the morning right. containing oats. Everybody has to walk and carry the newspaper in their left hand as they go up their driveway. I mean, it can be that ridiculous, but, you know, well, that's, that's the kind of thing. The, that's the point that Justice Kennedy, uh, who's been viewed uh, as the uh, swing vote on this, as uh, he's, he's asked the same question several times, and he never got, apparently did not get a, uh, an acceptable answer, which is if we approve Obamacare, are there any limits to the power of the federal government? And, he, and from uh, what the prognosticators have said, uh, who physically observed him in the court, he did not seem convinced by or persuaded or even happy with the answer. So he's probably going to be a, a vote against Obamacare. 
Um, I think that uh, I, th- I don't think it's going to go five four. I think it's going to go six three. I think Breyer um, may be a vote either Breyer or or Sotomayor may be a vote against uh, uh, Obamacare as well. So yeah, I think you're right, and I think when Obamacare dies, and we're having a meeting this weekend. Uh, of the America's Medical Society, we have Dr. Adam Doran, the director. We have the uh, Association of American Physicians and Surgeons that both Rand and Ron Paul belong to, meeting in San Diego. We're coming together with policies from doctors from all these multiple organizations, except for the AMA, I call it the American Murder Association, because they live by hex picks and coding things. We need to have a la- national boarded doctors that don't have to have state licensure. We need to have get rid of coding. We need to have a system where health care is affordable, but it's private. We don't want to have a public record system where every keystroke, everything you say, like the song from Sting, well, uh, every every word you say, everything you do will be recorded by your health care professional who's a white-coated policeman for the Obamacare New World Order. I mean, that's what we're facing. Right. <laughs> right, and and also the whole you know they said they left poo poo's death panels, but but there's already, already a big discussion when Dick Cheney got his heart transplant. There's a big well, why did he get a transplant? Yeah, that that whole thing well, about uh, that the government control what we should be receiving is is extremely scary. And by the way, but a lot of people can be arrogant and say, well, I have private insurance. No, it doesn't matter. If you're 75 and you need a clipped artery in your head at 11 o'clock on Saturday evening and the Health uh, Ethics Committee meets on Tuesday morning and you have a time window that if you don't have a clip, you're going to bleed out and die. If you need dialysis, if you need uh, chemotherapy or you need a bypass or cabbage, you're going to have to be submitted to an ethics panel. If they say no, put the doggy down. You're going to be given a lethal injection, a pat on the head, a couple of prayers, and cards to send to your relatives after your funeral. That's it. Well, I don't know. But I don't know about the lethal injection, but they'll probably just allow you to it's die. Gonna, it, have it, permission it, for the procedure. The, it'll take. Yeah, they'll let you die, but you'll also be seeing the rise of the death with dignity movement that started in Oregon. It'll spread like a cancer. And a lot of people, rather than dying a horrible death, will actually submit. And Obama, of course, the Ethics Committee will approve it for lethal injection. So you'll see that rise as well. Well, that that very well, that very well may be true. But it'll the be other a doctors thing. have already told me this. Anesthesiologists, other surgeons have already called me weekly and told me this is where it's going. Neurosurgeons yeah, Jane, coming back. Yeah. Is Jane Orion still hitting a- AAPS? She's yes, she is. Yeah, she's still one of the okay. uh, senior people there. And there's a, there's there's another lady that's actually running the organization now as a director, but she's a senior consultant for AAPS. Jane Orion, yeah. very 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 sharp lady. And yeah. uh, of course, I mentioned Dr. Ron and Dr. Rand Paul. I personally believe that uh, when you have any kind of single-payer system, whether it's big government like in Canada or Australia, we have big insurance, it's also bad, and you should get rid of coding, you should have some a, a system where it's affordable, you get rid of frivolous lawsuits, you make the cost of medical equipment supplies not go through the ceiling, you, dis, you disconnect the control of drug companies for provision of medical care, and you get rid of state licensing authorities because what happens is you want a board for surgeons. If a surgeon's retiring from Alaska and wants to work and scrub up two mornings a week because he's going to play golf and play with his grandkids, he should be able to. But right now when doctors are near retirement, especially with Obamacare, they're just going to quit. They're not going to be available. Even if they could work for another 10 or 15 years part-time, they're not going to work. And that's going to cause a shortage almost instantly of 150,000 doctors by multiple organizations' actuarial analysis. That means we're going to have an immediate and cataclysmic crisis. And if you have a national health disaster like a plague, a biological weapon release, uh, a release of a nuclear plant like Fukushima in America, any kind of disaster, we are not prepared to deal with it. And just the aging of the population. So Obamacare is going to be the final silver spikes with the heart of health care, forcing organizations into bankruptcy, doctors into retirement, and people will either be told, well, just go home, we're not giving you dialysis or bi- bypass, you know, may make your amends with your pastor and your and and all your relatives because you're going to die. Yep. So Sarah Palin was right, and the reason is she was smart enough to listen to her advisors who told her that this is the truth, and it really is. This is obscene. There's no need for this to happen. We could spend less money and provide more care if we took all these regulations, restraints, and licensing authority of each of the states away, and we had board certification where doctors had to do continuing education and maintain competency, but we didn't have oversight of some nanny state government that would control everything we do. It's ridiculous. 
Well, that, you know, you're a lot more familiar with those issues than I am, just because I'm not a doctor. I, I'm yeah, yeah, more, but, in, but I'm a, more involved it, with the legal end of it. Yeah, the legal side of it, though, I think, is you're going to see an explosion of what I call euthanasia care, end of life care. And even in Australia, there was a bill passed, or they tried to pass just a few weeks ago, where they were going to do postnatal abortion. And this is another issue that will come up if Obama gets a second term, is that postnatal abortion is an issue that came up in, in uh, South of the uh, in, in Australia, and people say, that can happen. I said, look, we have to understand that Obama even signed off on a bill in the state legislature of Illinois that would have terminated the life of a child that survived an abortion. Even people that are pro-abortion wouldn't do that, most of them. Well, yeah, it was interesting. Patrick Moynihan, uh, despite Catholic that he was, was a abortion supporter. But even he uh, was opposed to uh, partial birth abortion. He thought that was reprehensible and murder. Right. Right. You know, and a lot yeah. of people who would normally be pro-abortion uh, resist and, and, and refuse to uh, go along with the partial birth abortion. But there was obviously enough support to get it passed in Congress because of, you know, the, the power of, of, of Planned Parenthood and all their donations. And a lot of, a lot of people are afraid of well, the Well, the personhood issue needs to be dealt with. I'd like to, in the last waning minutes here, uh, do you think the personhood issue will be dealt with when Romney and probably Rubio run for president and vice president and take over the, uh, the government? I think Obama is going to win re-election. I've been saying that oh, for God, months. I, I believe it's... I, 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 I want a judgment on America. If Obama wins, we are so done. We are so destroyed. We are so, you know, it's almost like the ancient prophets. You rip your tear clothes, you throw sackcloth and ashes, and, and you cry out and go to the back of the cave and cry out to God's mercy on the country. That's how bad it is. If Obama gets another term, we are so finished. Well, I, but, and I, you know, I don't say that happily, but I, I think it's the reality. It's going to be the yeah, dirtiest. That's not good news to hear that from a very wise right. man like yourself that actually is out in the battlefield. That's not good news. Well, I think it's going to be the, one of the most corrupt elections in American history. I think it's going to be massive voter fraud. But I think in the end, because of the refusal of Congress to deal with voter fraud, because most of, many members of Congress are involved, heavily involved in voter fraud, especially right. on the Democratic side, but some on the Republican side, too. Uh, I think that uh, it won't get dealt with, and it's just going to be allowed. And uh, we've got the Obama Justice Department filing lawsuits every time there's an attempt to restrict voter fraud by the states. You're talking about uh, people just, like, uh, you're talking about the Department of Justice and, and the Attorney General's office under Eric Holder, who's another criminal in the, in the, in the uh, cabal of the abominator. Right. They want to make sure that voter fraud is rampant so that, because they believe it'll benefit Obama and he'll win. So, uh, you know, it's just going to be another, another big mess, but I believe he'll win. And, and the sad thing, too, is if you get Romney elected, no matter who his vice president is. If you get Romney elected, the Republicans will go along with all of his big government schemes. At least if Obama's reelected, the Republicans will oppose his big government schemes. So, you know, it's, it's kind of weird. So in, other but, words, yeah. in, other words, uh, in other words, we're hoping no matter what happens, if you get gridlock, at least you can gridlock it until Obama fades into history as a very bad choice. Well, we'll see. It's all in God's hands. It sure is. We better do some praying if you're uh, right that Obama gets back in. And we need to then vote on our congressional levels, our local levels, our state levels, that we hogtie these maniacs so they won't destroy the last shred of the Constitution that is literally hanging by a thread. By the way, uh, Doctor, I don't know if you know this, but I'm running for Superior Court in San Diego County since you're here. I will definitely, uh, we want to get you back because we want to get you uh, with your brilliance and your honesty and your sense of justice. We want to get you in the Superior Court for sure. We need to get you back well, on the show. Excellent. The when is that? On, the election on June 5th. June 5th. We better get the vote out. Again, Justice Gary Creep. Back in a moment.